Welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and this is a very special episode where we've got two reps from Napit with us. And not just everyday employees of Napit, I've got to say, we've got the head of training and we've also got Frank Bertie with us as well. And they're going to give us a run through of their history in the industry and also some of what Napit does to um, help out those people who are on training journeys in particular and wider beyond that so if I can start with you Frank first and foremost how are you today I'm uh, doing fine so, suffering with a cold slightly but uh, I've done two webinars this week so far so <laughs> okay yeah that's it isn't it when everything's on on zoom and over the internet now you can kind of go to work when you don't feel great but getting your voice over is a difficult one isn't it when you're not feeling well it is yes uh, no, thanks no, for no thanks for struggling through and coming on with us to have a chat chat today and we also got Brett with us how are you Brett yeah, all good. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, really good. Looking forward to it. I can see that you look to be in a training centre of some description behind you. You've got bits and pieces hanging off the wall. Yeah, no, hopefully nothing that anybody's going to pull up behind me. Though this is one of um, one of our assessment rooms at the Mansfield site, so um, uh, these aren't assessment boards, so you wouldn't see them. So uh, I just want to point that bit out. I'm not breaking any <laughs> rules or showing any rigs or anything that nobody should be looking at. So. Yeah, no, we, this is one of us training boards, but I am in the assessment room, so it's nice and quiet. Fantastic. We'll come back to speak a bit about the training and specific later on. But to start with, um, what's your background in the electrical industry, Brett? Where have you come into to work in training? I guess you're a, you're a trainer or a head of training. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a um, bit of a long journey. Um, I've, I started out in training actually as an apprentice accountant at a training centre in Chesterfield. Um, so we did, we primarily specialised in gas. So we, we, we went through the transition of going from ACOP through to what they now know as, as ACS. So that was a really good grounding for me. Um, worked my way up and around and through. So I've always been involved in and around training for the last um, 20 odd years. Um, but it, I suppose it was sort of around about 2004, 2005, started getting involved in the electrical side of things. Actually, that was working with Napit, so I weren't with working with them, but they were a local company to us at that point. So um, always known known the guys, known the team, respected the work that that they'd done. So um, yeah, it's really done done lots of work in and around that. And I joined them about two years ago now, or nearly two years. So all going well so far, unless Frank tells me any different. <laughs> so you're heading up the training department for the whole group of NAPIT, you've got sites all over the UK. Yeah. And yeah your experience yeah. is in training. So your your specific role is aimed at that. That's something that we often get, you know, a bit past ourselves with as electricians that we want all trainers to be electricians. But sometimes the best people to train aren't necessarily electricians themselves. So it's um yeah. it's good to know uh, that we've got an expert there like yourself. I won't go so far as expert, but now you've got different personalities and and for me it's about blending a team together. So I've got some great individuals um, that work for my, me, me within the within the group. I don't need to know everything. It's it's we'll work in collaboration and 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 hopefully deliver a quality product. So I'm trying to look after the customer experience journey, make sure we're where we should be. The guys are supported with the products and resources that they need to be to be the best that they can be because um it's definitely not about me uh, this is not this is something new for me sat in front of a camera doing this i'm normally behind the scenes and that's how i prefer to be within the training team as well so they're they're the team that go out and deliver and deliver good solid quality products and and i just help support make that happen fantastic fantastic and frank is it right to say that you're the technical director of NAPIT? is that still your job title at present mm -hmm. The full job title was the Chief Technical Officer. So I'm in charge of all things technical within NAPIT to make sure we perform at the high standards within um, NAPIT and all our functions. So, oh, Fantastic. And you've been in that role for quite a long time. I've, I've, as long as I've been in NAPIT, I've known your name and seen you as part of that that brand. I guess it's approaching, is it 30 odd years now since it's well, been? 30, 30 years since we formed NAPIT, yes. I was a uh, one of the founding members and directors of it from uh, the initial initial start of it. Um, Fantastic. And what's your background? Why did you come into the electrical industry way back in the distant past like myself? <laughs> yes, uh, quite way back, yes. Um, initially, I never intended to go into the electrical industry. Um, my um, ambition at that time was to be a vet. 
that time. But yes, so uh, I missed out on some key qualifications at the time at school. I wasn't meeting the requirements, so I had to change the direction. And I did some uh, electrical and electronic courses within the school. And that led me to get um, getting interested in electrics and electronics. And that, that uh, through that the course I did there, that got me into the employment arena for people looking for uh, electrical apprentices. And at the time, obviously, saying that, that was back in Dundee, when I um, where I'm originally from, and I had I was given the option of two apprentices. One was for an amateur winder, and the other one was for uh, an apprentice electrician. And uh, I did look at both of them, and I did prefer the apprentice electrician. I didn't find being stuck in one factory for the rest of my life. So, <clears throat> no offense to amateur winders, but um, I like <laughs> I like getting out and about. <laughs> So I, I joined um, a company in Dundee, um, a company called G uh, James Rear, and they were a small company. Um, they had, at the time when I joined them, there was three electricians and a boss, but we also run a, um, a, a, a showroom which uh, sold um, lamps, things like that. The, and part of my apprenticeship growing up was repairing Russell Hobbs kettles, and uh, Julet toasters, Murphy Richard irons, all these type of things as well as the company was involved in um, domestic, commercial, industrial. So we did all types of things. And it was a great, um, a great sounding apprenticeship where uh, it was hands-on uh, from the start. It's been a small company, you had to get involved in everything. So you've got to see installation, electrical systems, and also some of the products that are installed to be used on them as well. So I guess that's yes. you know, quite um, a wide, well, wide scope of stuff. Just as I said, going back, I started in 79. So, um, I was on day release. I was the last um, uh, year to do the fourteenth edition of the Warren regulations okay, when, it was, wow. when it was when it was still a guidance document. Um, <laughs> it was full of all, all the tips and um, <clears throat> information to provide with the uh, apprentices how to install things. So it told you how to got Ben Cons, you where you put your clips in, the spacings, all the things like that. <clears throat> and of course, as soon as I finished my apprenticeship, I had to go back and do the fifteenth. Because the fifteenth come in while I was doing my apprenticeship. <laughs> well, that's something that a lot of apprentices right now are going through in a different phase with the seventeenth moving over to the eighteenth, and now the amendments. We seem to see the changes more often, which is another a political discussion, I guess, around the electrical industry. But I guess it's always something that's happened, isn't it? That's something that you've said right there, right back in seventy nine. You had that as well. And going back, obviously, when the fifteenth come out, it brought in the inspection and testing which um, the work I was involved in as an apprentice and um, when I qualified from that point with the company, we were involved in a lot of uh, fault finding and inspection and testing. And back then, um, it was um, neutral earth loop testing. And we had all clear wooden instruments with the carry around to do them, as yeah. opposed to the, the modern earth, loop, uh, earth fault loop impedance tester. So the 15th introduced all that. That got me involved in inspection and testing more. Um, I really found uh, a big interest in that that side of it. So we kept doing that. Then we had the 16th. Uh, I moved um, from the company I served my time with. Uh, as usual with companies, they wouldn't uh, give me a, my approved grading at that time because they didn't want to pay the extra money. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I took the decision to leave and I moved to a bigger company, which again was quite a big company in Dundee. They had 120 electricians. So there okay. was a lot of jobs and I ended up being um, like contracts manager and doing inspection and testing for those contracts. Then they were, uh, they lost, uh, they were owned by a builder who went bankrupt. So the, the company was taken over by James Scott. And so I moved over to there um, until 88. I was doing inspection testing them, managing sites, doing things like that. Then I moved into London, 88. Um, Due to personal circumstances, uh, my girlfriend come over here. I come down and I got involved in electrics down in London. And the inspection and testing market was just kicking off in London, and people really weren't um, that aware of it or really involved in it. And because of my background, I really got heavily involved in inspection and testing. I set a company up when I come down here, uh, specialized in inspection and testing in '89. Then, um, as always with training. Um, we got involved in a lot of training, and that's when I come across uh, John Andrews um, and got involved in NAPIT, which we'll talk about more later. 
Yeah, I mean, that leads us quite nicely into NAPIT. And there's going to be apprentices who are watching this maybe don't know what NAPIT is. So I guess first and foremost, if um, Brett, you maybe want to cover this one off, what does the acronym NAPIT actually stand for? No, no well, uh, back in the day, it would have been the National Association of Professional Inspectors and Testers. But um, I think as all things that were a bit of a mouthful. So um, rebranding, new modern world. Um, depends where you are. If you're in the north, it's NAPIT, NALAD. Uh, <laughs> down south, it's NAPIT. Um, so, yeah, so everybody will be looking saying, is it NAPIT or is it NAPIT? In the office here, it's NAPIT. If you're further south, yeah, NAPIT. I used to say it as, as NAPIT, I will be honest, but then I was educated at some trade shows by people who work for, for NAPIT, and I've said it correctly ever since then. Um, <laughs> and I guess that bit's nicely with what your background was frank back at the start if it is a national association professional inspectors and testers and that's extensively what you did is that how you fit into that at the beginning yes um i, I got involved um uh, in the discussions about uh, about NAPIT with uh, john mike and uh, a few of those at the time and it was a case of at the time there was no uh, organization for inspection people can't do inspection testing only you had to be an installation contractor to join any, any other scheme at that time. So we had a, a, I did a training course with John at his training centre in Chesterfield. And he, after that, we had a discussion. He said, I've got something you might be like to be involved in. So um, I got involved. There were six of us to start it. And we set up um, the National Association of Professional Inspection Tests in 92. And we run with that for <clears throat> probably four four years where we're hitting about 500,000 members, people interested in that. Then we started getting some contractors we did inspection tests and we're still involved in that. Then that's when um, Part P come along and we were a uh, Zurich certification partner uh, for Part P. That's where I first met them all. Uh, and that's, when, where, that's where we got introduced yeah. to that. And um, we, um, at the time, NIC bought out um, Zurich certification and um, we took over the Part P then, then onwards our membership just kept increasing um, because we really were a comprehensive scheme for uh, people can electrical work in the domestic sector, as well as all other sectors as well. We cover all the full range of people can electrical work. And I guess that's how most people will be aware of you guys as a, as a CPS, competent person scheme. Um, but you do also get involved in other areas, other industries, I think I've seen. Do you have a, a gas scheme as well? Is that right to say we don't have a gas schemes uh in that side of it we we run the micro generation schemes or building fabrics um okay so from ventilating heat, heating windows uh all, all the things like any place where a competent person scheme could be run obviously with the gas scheme it's um gas safety run it the health yeah. and safety run that one so but that'd be under aim wouldn't it or what was past 2030 green deal that side of things where we we cover a range of measures um as well so as as the world continued to evolve, we've diversified the products to support members and go where members are going. Um, if you look at yeah, starting out with the electrical schemes and then MCS and then through to Green Deal and that, so we have we have diversified um, what we do because we've got the core skills and competence and knowledge within that, and then we've recruited accordingly to 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 move into those spaces. Fantastic. And we'll we'll delve a bit more into the um, changes around the EAS document and NAPIT's involvement with that in a, in a little while. But just to speak about the, the size and scope of the, the company as a whole, now you guys produce a range of books. Some of them are behind me there and they're fantastic. It's nicely positioned. Yeah, you're also involved with, um, there's in, insurance schemes that you have for your members as well as the training, obviously, Brett, that you're doing. Yep. It's quite a vast range that you you provide to industry, isn't it, when you step back and look at that? Hmm. Yeah, no, um, yeah. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of those are wraparounds that we support. So if you look at the insurance, so we'll work with the We'll work with brokers and the insurer, so we we're, we're constantly looking to try and achieve uh, a, a fantastic product, a, a value for our customers. So through economies of scale, we can negotiate on 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 our members' behalf effectively. So that's what we're constantly doing, trying to support. I know that it's, it can be seen as just another money making thing, but we do actually get to sit down in front of the insurer 
go through and, and walk them through the risks. Um, and we do we do make look at the policy to make sure it's fit for purpose for what we're doing. Um, Napier, um, one of the one of the leading ones in the um, getting professional indemnity um, added into added into the policies and having that more as common practice for the kind of work that people are doing. So, yeah, it can sometimes be seen that. Here we go again, but but it's not meant in that way, in any shape or form. If you're a, if you're coming out of your apprenticeship and you've got that level of experience and you're wanting to set a business up, we can take a lot of the pain away and you can have a product that you know that you can trust in. So um, we 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 often see ourselves as a bit of an insurance policy anyway, with um, looking after looking after members and trying to help them um, through all of that. Yeah, you'll always get the negative noise when the, there's this accusation around generating money and things. But I find that a really helpful service that NAPIT provide. I'm a NAPIT member, just to put it out there for people who are listening. I use the insurance services from you guys. And um, it, it covers us in all the ways I need at a very affordable level. You know, I've, from Yorkshire, we typically do shop quite a lot on price. And I can say you're among the better value providers out there. And you know, it's that, not all about taking money off your members. Sometimes it's about helping them, I think. And that's a message that we need to get over better with all the CPSs and some of this stuff you put forward. Well, we are having discussions, obviously, with the marketplace is starting to revolve and you electricians are having to start getting up on roofs and things. And, yeah. and then that that brings a different risk risk to it. So um, we are in uh, we are in discussion about what a new insurance policy looks like. If people are starting to install solar PV, um, with more um, more vigor, then we need to make sure that the the standard policy does cover people for that because it, it is obviously something in the current current climate where people people have got the gas and electricity bills where they are looking to save money and 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 again our members are helping support that as that roll out of becoming um, um, self sufficient in terms of generation of, of electricity. And I guess we're going to see that through the training as well, the courses that you're offering there at, at Napier to help electricians upskill yep. in those areas. And then obviously there's apprentices who are coming out of their time now. It's going to be a big part of their careers as they move forward. And there's the new domestic electrician apprenticeship as well. So you must be seeing a lot of demand for that, I guess, at the minute, Prep. Uh, we've, we've had a, a little bit of demand. No, it, <laughs> it, 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 is, it, it is one of them. It's we've we we've always had that offering, so it it, it wasn't new to us. We've we have upskilled and trained and and, uh, and met a number of staff. But bef before, if you if you roll back 12, 24 months, and you'd said to me, put a energy storage course on, I'd have just laughed at you because my numbers wouldn't have added up on a calculator. But now you're seeing that if you can get some levels of um, self-sufficiency or grid independence up to sort of 80 percent by having a PV and a battery storage system, then it's starting to become a no-brainer. If that um, price per kilowatt keeps going up and then the more more people that are installing it, the price, every, there's competition for the work, the number of panels generated, blah, 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 blah. It just starts it just starts making sense for people to have and um, becomes hopefully more affordable for, for for homeowners. And I think that, um, and, and again, there's nothing wrong with people making money out of helping people save some money for me. So if um, if we can train them and uh, if we train people and assist assist with that, then then fantastic. And you must have seen some of that Frank in development of the regs. Is it fair? Are you on JPL 64, I assume? Yes, part part of the one I'm I'm on uh, the main committee JPL sixty four, which looks after um, the creation of the regulations for PSI and IT to publish it. I'm also on uh, one of the subcommittees, uh, subcommittee A for verification. I currently am the deputy chair for that one, so we go through um, the model forms um, and we go through all the changes in part six. We do part one, part two, part three, and um, uh, we cover some of the bits on the appendices as well. So the model is form it, appendix six. Is it thanks to you we've got less boxes to tick on the schedule of inspections? Because uh, if, no, you, he'll, if he'll, he'll put more. might owe you a drink or two for that one. <laughs> he'll put <laughs> more down this booker. Don't don't listen to him. He, he, he loves a box of uh, forms to fill out. Yes, it's it's, it's part of the um, the comments received during the uh, draft for public comment. So we we'll looked looked at the uh, aspects of our um, the contractors were finding. 
they're filling a lot of boxes in for something that they had to do anyway. It had to be done correctly. They couldn't say it wasn't done correctly. It was either mm. a tick or an NA. And they've still got to do all the things. That's why we've, we've retained the checklist in the Appendix 6 on the model forms. So the contractor could use it as a checklist. They don't need to provide it with a certificate. You've got your new smaller 14 uh, tick box in there, but you've still got the uh, full checklist to go through the things you should be checking for that are appropriate for the type of installation. So and it's, it's, it's useful for that type of thing where we do reduce the content, but the information is still gathered and still checked. Yeah, I mean, those tick boxes are really helpful for apprentices, actually, because they kind of lead you towards things you need to be doing in an installation that you're maybe not fully aware with while you're on a, a learning journey. And the, the NAPIT certification software is actually really good as well at leaning towards that. So as is on Frank's background, they have fast test. For those yeah. of you who aren't aware, I've reviewed that on my um, YouTube channel as well. I'm, I'm a big user of fast test. And I think it's really helpful the way that you can fill those um, tick boxes in in bulk on our mass to save admin for, for a seasoned electrician, if you like. But they do still have that there to work through for some of the apprentices who are maybe checking off that they've actually followed the stages of work they need to consider. But I think it is still important that we have those, but it was getting a little bit out of hand, I think. Yeah, well, obviously, if you're if you're doing the electronic versions, it's, it's easier. Uh, if you're doing it... Um the hand, hand uh, pages with the NCR pads, it does make it more difficult to do ticks all the time. And um, uh, I'd always, always preferred the electronic ones because um, it makes it neater and legible. Because sometimes you're doing handwritten stuff, it's not always legible. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people today will be familiar with even filling in, in by hand. My guys, um, Matt is 25 now. He's never filled a certificate in by hand in his life. If he was asked to do that, he'd probably throw a massive strop and hissy fit over it. It's so one of those things which um, they don't know the pain of, I think, the modern generation of electrician. Um, it does make things insanely easier. And NAPIT Fast Test is really good at that because it links in as well with um, code breakers. So for those of you who aren't aware, the, the, one of the NAPIT books is a code breakers, one which gives um, guidance towards what codes you might want to apply to certain faults you discover on an electrical installation during the ICR. And that links in as well with your report. It automatically drags through regulation numbers. I think that kind of thing is mm -hmm. really helpful to electricians. Um, so, you know, how do you guys go about producing those things? Are you involved with that yourselves, producing the book like Code Breakers and tying that in with Fast Test? Yes, we're um, the, the Code Breakers itself. Um, uh, for anyone in the electrical inspection and testing uh, industry, and I've been as involved for a long time. Um, when I first started doing it, when I set my company up, it was a case of doing it with uh, a typewriter and sticking six by four photographs on the page. So you, you talk about, I think my first computer was a 386 PC. So you go back to that time when wow. that was that was a, a, a great advancement for doing inspections. But before we used to do them in one line correction typewriters and stick the, part of the photographs on. But yes, um, getting into the... Um, uh, inspections when i used to do it we used to do it on word when you could put codes into words the word documents so you put your db01 and that come up with and you type that in and it come up with your code you want it for that so over the years we've developed um versions of code breaker in there and we then got involved and pulled all together and richard townsend is the author of it he he pulled it together as a book we myself and paul chaffers were going to put it together as uh, part well, we started putting together in the Compton Personal Magazine. Then Richard came along and says we can make a book out of this. So then we started creating the first book, which is which in 2017 we created the first Code Breakers, which was on the 17th edition. And obviously then the 18th had come out, so a new version come out. The Amendment Two, the next one come out, and the um, on-site solutions we we got involved creating that as well because it was a a user-friendly guide uh, to follow through a sequence how jobs are thought of, designed, installed, inspected, and tested, and created. Then we created one on the, uh, the private rent sector when that came out. And we also had the inspection and testing one, which again lays out inspection and testing in a user-friendly fashion, following the sequence and giving you good guidance on how to do the inspection and testing. I think and the code breakers one's the, the one that the feedback's insane on that. And you may not agree with every single code, but as you said earlier, Mark, I think it, it, it gives people a view and w within the regs, there are different ways of doing different things, which is why it's 
you you as the person making the decision on site let's say you, that's where um you you're the one making that judgment and you can only make that judgment call that's why our technical helpline they have the hardest job in the world uh, you can't see a job you're going off of what people are telling you but yeah the code breakers without doubt has has assisted giving people a steer you know, like i've got friends that are electricians and and they've all got they're all carrying one round flicking through and uh, sometimes they ask me for questions so i'm lucky enough i can just uh, drop frank a message and i get 24 7 support on that so it's quite good <laughs> Yeah, that's one of the things with electricians. We will never agree on codes. Whatever you do, there'll always be something in there that someone doesn't like. But I think code breakers is universal, universally accepted has been a very, very good stab at making that happen. Yeah. And you see the list of contributors. That's what I was kind of leading towards. If you look in the front cover of that book, you've got people from across industry helping you and guiding you towards that. So this seems like you've uh, kind of put your hands up and said, you know, come and help us. We want to put this together and help um, industry with some code coding guidance. Let's see what all your thoughts are. So, I mean, that must be quite an epic challenge trying to get people to well, feed into it. It is um, is a task for um, Richard to coordinate everybody to get the information in, especially when you start going through the review stage of it. And um, people say, oh, I didn't think that would change something different on this one. But we've gone through the process. This is the answers. It's, it's getting the, the final product is good. And getting into the uh, fast test software was um, a good great idea to help people doing the EICR so they could pull them into the reports as well. Obviously, you've got to add um, your particular information to the observations you're talking about. Um, so add where it is, what, what it's about, but the information's there along with the code. And yeah. as, as Brett said, the code, it's guidance. If the code is, you feel higher on site or lower on site, that's what the your view as an inspector, you've got to be able to have that uh, um knowledge to be able to carry that out the thing i think is really nice about that particular book is that the regulation number that it's related to is in there so if you do want to go and clarify it yourself you can jump straight in the regs book and see what the intent is behind that guided code i think that's fantastic and the on-site solutions in your periodic inspection and testing books as well maybe it were good enough to send us in um four boxes full of those to give out to apprentices and the feedback i've got back from people who had use of them has been really good so i think you're doing all the right things in supporting electricians with this literature it's nice to see cps is putting out there and these aren't expensive books either when you look at the cost of the the regs books and some of the other guidance notes that are out there um you know it's affordable stuff from a learner's point of view so you're keeping that cost down to help people out it's fantastic well it's, it's one thing that we, we believe in NAPA is pushing forward the information to people in the industry and that's why we do the, the webinars, as I mentioned earlier. That's why we're around the country doing our expos this year and involved in the ELEX events as well. And uh, we do the regular webinars for our members. We do additional webinars for uh, the one I did this week was for landlords in, in Wales uh, on the new PRS regulations that came out yesterday. And um, we did one for insurance industry yesterday as well. So it's all, it's all getting the information about electrical safety and the importance of getting things carried out correctly by competent people yeah 100 percent, and it's brilliant that you're involved at every stage of of doing that and you know you, you offer free membership i believe to apprentices apprentices as well is that true some yes. sort of seamless link i nearly jumped in and said that yeah we um <laughs> we, we've, we've we've developed something called napier foundation which is really um aimed at supporting students colleges training any training establishment really so if you're whether you're a student whether you're a the de big debate of whether you're a lecturer tutor or trainer i don't know what any or even the assessor let's say so everybody likes a little title my my team want to be called tutors they don't want to lecture people but uh or that's what they say to me but um no we we offer a product called uh on napit foundation which is which is free to access and it does give you um, uh, access to our technical helpline, gives you things like the, the, our Competent Person magazine access and, um, to, and through some of the CPD webinars that we do as well. So there are some other stuff that's um, where you can get older some products, but but in 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 the main, the the technical support that we can offer is there for people. So we are we are pushing that out. Um, we've even like the rigs, the sort of rigs, um, or the boards behind me, should I say, 
um, we can develop those for training centers and colleges. So we've got a wealth of knowledge um, and we're just trying to help the industry with pulling together a quality product that then they can use and which makes their life easier. That's fantastic. And apprentices having access to the technical helpline is brilliant because unfortunately, as, as we know, in industry, they're not always supervised in the way that they maybe should mm -hmm. be. And having that help at the end of a firm from an organization like Napit, if they've got doubts or questions on something they've been asked to do, you know, that's got to be a good thing. So if you are an apprentice or a trainee listening to this and you're not aware of it, you can go off and sign up to become a member um, and have access to that with Napit totally free of charge. And it's well worth going and looking into yeah, yeah. Um, more widely speaking about the changes of becoming a member of a CPS, because lots of people enter into training to be electricians, either through the retrainee route or through an apprenticeship. Short courses, as we know now, have kind of moved into the distant past. But what are the changes in the ES document now? What's the requirement that you need to meet to join NAPIT um, and enroll on your CPS register? Well, the, the requirements did change um, in last September, but um, through all the advancement of the EES, the Electrotechnical Assess Assessment Specification, we've always, uh, and part again, part of my committee work is sitting on that, that, uh, that committee to do that, um, but we've always looked to increase the requirements for the entry levels into the industry. Uh, and at the start when... It was first thought about there was a lot of people in the industry working without qualifications um, without test equipment all the things like that so it's been a gradual step up process to increase the entry levels to increase the um, requirements for um, everyone to enter into the industry um, and it's each advancement of ees has increased that entry level thank um, you one Sorry, yeah, no, go on, sorry. And then I think if you look at that, Mark, if you, you go back to sort of 2005, I think it was the 16th edition. If you've got the 16th edition qualification, and I I, uh, I even got through uh, 16th edition, or uh, no, it might have been 17th, actually. Um, but you, you go through that, and then that could be, you could apply to a competent person scheme back then. So then 2012 brought about a really substantial change, which... Um, because we back in the day, work with EAL, um, city and guilds in developing. So they're trying to, trying to, because you, you hear Part P courses floating about and it does make me smile that there's Part P course. But yeah, there's there a lot of, lots of terminology that were knocking around back in the day. But, um, but 2012 brought a quite a big change. But then I think more so over the last couple of years in particular, the committees getting together, you've got, You've got the you've got the awarding organisations, the competent person scheme providers, everybody basically within the industry and working working in collaboration to to pull that document together. So a lot of the qualifications now have got starting to have prerequisites come with them. So so I know it's probably not come quick enough, soon enough, but in some in some ways, but to 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 bring people along and create a journey and that's where we're at where um it feels like we're in a really good place moving moving forward um and it may not always feel like uh, felt like that to get to where we are you know frank and frank and the team working on working on those committees and and, and guiding to where we are so so now it's not a, i've got I've done a couple of weeks here or there or whatever. You've got to now, there is fully laid down qualifications, um, depending on the um, scope of work that you're gonna, you're gonna look in to become a, a member with, because I do believe that us as CPS providers, we do have a role um, because getting a qualification is one thing, being able to apply that qualification and 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 hopefully completing installation or inspection and testing work correctly. Um, we don't we don't see every single job that somebody does, but but we at least we are temperature checking people to see whether they're maintaining what their what their certificates and that do say that, that, that they should have within their skill set. Yeah, I mean you get your surveillance visits, don't you, every year. Um, so there is that ongoing checking of your members, but it was more that gatekeeping, as Frank mentioned, that's kind of been reinforced. Now, my understanding is that it's kind of moved towards the level three NVQ as kind of 
that's yeah. kind of the golden ticket, if you like. I think there are some other little bits and pieces around that where there can be some legacy qualifications that maybe you know don't quite equate to that in terms of what it says on the certificate, but there's some work around, I guess, um, because of the qualifications all the people have done back in the day. But that seems to be what it is. Is that about right, Frank? Yeah, what, what we've got as well, the company's ES, we've got the qualification guide as well. So it does lay out the range of qualifications from old times. Like uh, if you go back when I started my apprenticeship, there wasn't such a thing as an AM2. <laughs> <laughs> well, before that time. So, yeah, so there's a lot of people still in the industry have got the older style qualifications. And when they come to look at becoming um, um, a member of a competent person scheme, sometimes they've got to go through some additional hoops to get in there now. So I'd have to go back and do the um, MGQ route. Uh, and sometimes it's not a case of going back and starting from scratch. You're, as Brett goes through the stuff, you do your portfolios, you check out what you've actually got and what you need to fill those gaps. And that's what you're looking at. And we're getting away from the point where people are turning up without anything at all, never worked in the industry. So we're looking at people who are in the industry. I've got some gaps. How do we fill those gaps? How do we make them up to date with the requirements of the competent person schemes of the regulations of the health and safety requirements and make sure they are competent to carry out safe electrical work yeah i, I support and agree with that i think that the aes is a great thing the industry does as brett said that you all come together there's the cps's the iet um eci eci i assume you're all kind of involved in those discussions and put forward what these standards are that that base um, point as long as it's there and it's applicable to everybody and we're all playing on the same field if you like i think that's fair enough i can't yeah. see a better way of doing it to be totally totally honest I, um, I, and it does it does give you a lot of um guidance as well of how you look after the different uh, levels of of operatives within your organization as well so where they should be looked at looked at where they should be supervised what type of work they could do and what requirements as an organization you've got for your employees to make sure you're not putting them at risk. You're making sure they are trained to do the job safely and carry out the work to the best uh, abilities they have. And if they, they can't do that themselves without adequate supervision or um, guidance or whatever you're doing with them, they, that's all laid out there. So it's not a case of out there, do what you want to do. There's a process you've got to follow. And when we go out and assess, um, our members, um, that's the type of things we look at. How you look after your uh, employees, operatives, what what levels they're at, what CPD, CPD they do, yeah. and going forward, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and I'll, I'll link in the show notes to this podcast episode um, over to that ES document, so anyone wants to read it can go and have a look. Um, and it links off to other places as well. I had a, a, I think it was back in September when it first came, and I had a good feel around it at that time. Um, so it's well worth checking out if you are on a, on a learning journey. I guess where it gets muddy for people, if you're kind of fresh into industry and you're training to to qualify, you're going to end up in the right place, roughly speaking, to be able to enrol to a CPS. But as we've said, with some of those legacy qualifications, you might end up with a skills scan and going down an experienced worker route assessment, something along those yeah. lines. Yeah, is that yeah. something you offer, Brett, in training at Napit, or is that not a course you guys cover yourselves? Um, we, we, we do. We've reached out. We're, we're working with... Um couple of training partners to to deliver that that's not not our um currently our core skill set within the training department so we've worked with um a couple of partners um to be able to offer that for people that are looking to come through and um we're very lucky with uh so quite heavy vetting process so um again we we don't want that to be abused the assessor that we've got, I will say, is bloody brutal. He is brutal. I've got somewhere is just like, no, they're not coming in. Um, and they're not they're not ready for the, the experienced worker route qualification. And and that that is a great thing for me. Um, because uh, I I'm we're not trying to just push people through for the sake of it. So the I hear so many stories of people that have done qualifications back in day they've got work and they've worked for a company they've classed themselves for all intents and purposes as as an electrician but when they come to present themselves uh, where where we've got to as an industry they're not they're not there from what we'd like to see as a qualification um, perspective so we are we do work um, we do work on that 
Um, I think my, a lot of my team and probably you two guys, they can tell within 10 minutes whether somebody's an electrician or not just by the, the language and the way that they talk. So so it, it, it is great. I've got, I'm not saying 100%, but I'm really, really confident with with the, the, the partners that we've got and work with that they, that they will do a great service for NAPIT and make sure that we don't get any negative press for uh, becoming a sausage factory that's just churning out people and giving tickets because that's not, that's not what we're about. I say to any of my team, I'm never going to be a training manager that says that person passes or anything like that. If they're not good enough, you've got to have the... Um, I need to pick my words right. You've got to have the uh, confidence in yourself and you've got to be able to tell people that they're not to standard. And um, yeah, we'll never pass anybody on a training course that, that isn't or doesn't meet that standard. Yeah, I mean, it's good to hear. There's got to be that that gatekeeping, hasn't there, at the end of the day? You're gatekeeping eventually to be a, a member of your organisation, but you're also training people. And if they don't meet that requirement, then too right, they should fail. And it's not your fault at the end of the day if you provided the training in a in a reasonable way. It's, you know, sometimes people don't grasp. It's always bad training. The, num the number of people that want the money back because they failed, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's funny. Yeah, I think that's one of the, the natures of anything. Um, yeah. It's easy to blame the, the people providing the training rather than reflect on yourself sometimes. Um, it's one of those things, isn't it? It's difficult, but it's nice to see that you do have a, a mechanism in place to support some of those people because I imagine there will be quite a few out there who have maybe not had the historical training that they needed, as we said, with the explosion of Part P, as it was back in 2004 or 5, whenever. Um, there was an extensive drive of training courses that maybe didn't lead people to have the qualifications they would need now to enroll with a CPS provider if they're moving around between the NIC and you guys or whatever, and they're going to have to update their legacy qualifications. Or even with the rogue trainers that we've seen tests drive at the minute, I spoke to somebody just last week who'd been on a, a short course that proclaimed to provide them with all the qualifications they need, and it was anything but. So the fact that that's there to maybe help people out is fantastic. That's heartbreaking, but you know, when you, for us, and you, you, somebody's on the phone to you and wanting to do this, or well, and then it's it's no good. They're like, then you're getting into, yeah, you're getting into discussions. Then, and it's not a blame, it's not a blame game. It's that's what the entry requirements are. That's what that's what that says. So we 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 it's actually good with the EAS document. We do so we do genuinely support um that and 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 enforce that so it's um it is good it does stand it does help us have something that we can all stand behind and say well this is an industry thing it's not just it's not just us being awkward or anything like that so no i think getting that message out there for people of a uh, retraining in particular that that document exists is a, is a really important thing we need to try and do across industry because there is a lot of people who are still missold these short courses. Yeah. It's still going on now. This person, you know, it was only a couple of months ago. And as Frank said, this is from September time where these changes have come in. And they're a couple of thousand pound out of pocket for two weeks worth of training that's really serving them no purpose whatsoever. So that, that, that fact that that's still happening and people don't feel like they've got access to the information that they need you know, and what actually do I need to do to qualify as an electrician? Um, I think that's one of the beautiful things about being at a training at, at NAPIT. I'm not, our clientele is is different, I'd say. We, we, it, ours is is topping up existing skills and knowledge. We don't, we don't as a rule, retrain from, from scratch. That's not, that's not yeah. where we're positioned at. It's CPD training, upskilling that we do. Um, obviously emerging markets where there'll be some uh, money attached to it for people sort of installing like electric vehicle charging or whether it's solar PV and things. So you do, you do start to see people, that's the new shiny thing that they are, that they're chasing. And it's trying to put the reins on people to understand that it's, it's not that simple. If you want to run the business is one thing, but employ good people around you and do it that way rather than trying to, trying to become an electrician in uh, a couple of weeks or yeah. right, took a long route and done four. But yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is it wasn't really a, a applying that back onto yourselves at NERPIT. That yeah. was more widely an in industry, I guess. And, no, no. And Tess, Tess were doing that, in fairness, but it's getting that message out there when people go off onto Google and 
hit qualifies an electrician up in the search bar and some of these sponsored adverts come up for these courses we know it works on google sometimes so i think as an industry if we keep sharing that master message on podcasts like this i assume you guys will cover it in your magazines and things as well and at trade shows and events that you go to and more awareness we can raise around that is a, yeah. is a good thing yeah the thing with the es uh, i know the changes come about in uh, september 21 but they were announced in uh, a year before that the, the yeah. change were coming in so there, it wasn't as if they just come in in september last year they were widely promoted widely announced throughout industry that these changes were coming into effect and this was going to come into force in september uh, last year so it was a case of it was well announced the people that got caught out with it yeah they weren't, weren't, weren't listening to what industry was saying so that's that's important we, and we don't just bring things in um off the cuff or things like that we do consider them give a time period for things to come in even with the change of the, the regulations we we'll look at the the time when it's got to come in and on the committee we'll go through it all and we've got a time scale and a program that goes through and time for it to be implemented and come into force so yeah i think in, in terms of being in industry you're dead right frank that information was out there and we were all very much aware of it but i'm more thinking of people who are fresh to industry and maybe don't read and take in that content and they're you know, they're retraining from being a chef or whatever. And um, then maybe the first bit of information they get doesn't come from industry. It's coming from a marketing campaign by a training provider. Um, so it's, it's tricky. It's a hard one to solve. It does still go on. I speak to those people every week with Apprentice One to One. And it is tragic when it happens to somebody and they don't really don't know any better. Um, it, but that's not on you guys to solve. That's a wider discussion. Oh, but it's, 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 it's there for us as well to keep promoting the, the correct message. And I think that's what's uh, down to us as. NAP is an organisation uh, and uh, on the training side as well. That we're not going to train people up from uh, scratch because you don't have the information, you don't have the abilities, the knowledge, the experience, and that's what you've got to go through the full route. So. Yeah, too right, too right. Is there anything either of you would like to add to the discussion before we close this one out? You've both been very good with your time and given us a in-depth insight to what NAP is. Um, anything else you want to add? There's one thing that's always, um, I know you promote it quite a bit as well, is the, uh, it's the safe isolation process that is correct, correctly followed and every electrician should be carrying a voltage detector, not a volt stick, a voltage detector and a proven unit and a lock-off kit to make sure they are safe when they're carrying any work on any electrical system. And it's just the basic thing you had. I had it when I, but since I've been an apprentice. And um, I'm not necessarily lock off devices because when I started, we were putting fuses in, so <laughs> <laughs> rewirable fuses. So yeah, so it was. It's something that is very important, and we 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 try and promote that with our our twelve steps to safe isolation. We promote that all the way through the lock off kits. It's something that is very important that every anyone in the electrical industry should be aware of. They've got to work safely. 100%. And if you're working with an employer and they've only got a lock that will fit one lock, get them to get a hasp. If you're an apprentice, you can put your lock on there as well. So at least you know there's uh, control from the supervising person and you've also got your own lock on there as well. It's a good working method to get into. We use that in our company now so the apprentices can know that the power can't be turned back on just because the boss decides it's now safe to do so and they've maybe not consulted with you. So it's, you know, it's getting into those working methods, isn't it? I think we've all been guilty in the past, I have, of not isolating as well as I should have done. Um, but education and raising that bar as a collective industry to make sure that we're not having accidents. Everybody's heard Louise Adamson and her story about her brother Michael and the tragic consequences that come from not safely isolating and working dead are tragic. So, you know, make sure you are putting those processes in place. Uh, Anything you want to add, Brett? No, no, I'm going to say on, on the back of that, the standing joke within training, if anybody asks me what I need to do, I'm going in for an assessment. I'm 2391 or something. What do I need to do? So it's just make sure you safely isolate because the number of the genuinely the number of people that have failed within the first 15 minutes because they've just they've they've cracked on basically how they've been working out in in industry and it, it is it is uh alarming so that's why frank and the team we we're, we're constantly banging the drum you've got to you've got to work safely you've got to work safely not just for you it's for for other other people as well you it can have devastating consequences so yeah it is and it's a gate it's a gatekeeping exercise for getting here at amt complete because you need to do it 
during the AM2 assessment. And we've had a guest come on here and the tip I gave them was to make sure they put the key somewhere safe once they had isolated, because that's a fail if you don't. And they didn't. And they actually failed their AM2 for just that reason, which is very ironic. And they found it highly amusing because they were told several times, but it's the basics sometimes that you forget. Um, so yeah, make sure you're staying safe. Thank you both for giving up your time for coming to chat. I'm going to pop a link in the description to the YouTube video and the podcast back to Napit's website because that is another vast resource of information and much of what we've discussed today is all on there. If you want to go off and get a copy of the, the books we've mentioned or enroll as a, an apprentice member of Napit, all the information is over on there. If you want to join them as your CPS provider, I can't recommend them enough. Um, I've been with Napit now for donkey's years and i will be remaining so for the foreseeable future um, so credit to all of you guys and girls at that organization i know sometimes on social media it feels like a bit of a beating that the yeah. cps is often yeah. get and trainers brett i'm sure you've had that in the past yeah, just a bit yeah it's not always like that i think you do a good job you're just people trying to work hard in in, in different roles within industry um, and sometimes it's nice to be nice so credit to you all uh, if you've got any comments and you want to ask any questions on this particular podcast do drop them in below i'll try and get back to everybody and as i say frank i know he's all over social media with his own profiles i can provide links to those as well if he agrees to it i don't know if brett is but if he is i'll drop those in as well yeah, and otherwise we'll see you on the next episode of the apprentice one-to-one -one podcast thank you Mark. thank you cheers thank you for listening to the latest episode of the apprentice one-to-one -one podcast sponsored by schneider electric Please like and subscribe to the channel, get involved with the comments and we will see you on the next one.